Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back to the bucket classes and to the first session of our winter session. Okay? So today we are very pleased um, to welcome uh, Mike. I'm sorry, Mike, Mike Latham. I'm sorry. My brain is not uh, on yet. Um, we're very glad to have you back again. Mike is a vice president at the college, at Grinnell College, and he's speaking today on the wider history of the Vietnam War, more than an American tragedy. Before I turn it over to Mike, though, I want to remind you, please, to silence your cell phones and turn on your T-coil if that applies to you. Now, welcome, Mike. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Yay. Terrific, great. Uh, thanks, thanks very much to you all for coming. It's really, it's great to be back here, uh, and great to have a chance to talk with you all. Uh, it's, it's especially fun for me to be back in a, in a teaching environment. Um, uh, working as the Vice President for Academic Affairs at Cornell, I, I really love what I do, but it's taken me out of the classroom. And, and I'm very happy to be back in the classroom, uh, because at heart I really am a historian. Uh, and teaching and, and spending time with students of, of all backgrounds and ages is something that I really love to do. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be back here and to have a chance to, to speak with you all. Uh, the theme of this course uh, is, is the wider uh, Vietnam War. And, and I chose that, that theme for, for a few different reasons. Um, one of them is that for many Americans, uh, when we think about Vietnam, we typically think about a war that begins uh, in the American perspective in 1965, which was the year at which American combat troops were, were deployed in large numbers. Uh, and for many Americans, imagine the war then ending in 1975, uh, with the final uh, collapse of the South Vietnamese government in Saigon, and images like the one that you see on the slide here, uh, one of the last uh, American helicopters lifting off the roof of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, uh, evacuating uh, South Vietnamese uh, in the few hours before uh, North Vietnamese tanks uh, and soldiers then uh, raced into the city. And American memories of the end of the war, uh, in particular, are, are quite vivid. And the images are ones that, that we've seen and are, are familiar with. Um, they were broadly televised, they captured our imaginations, and they seemed to reflect the, the end of, of, of this tragedy. Uh, so the image that you see above is, is also from the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, um, and it conveys a sense of the panic and desperation uh, that was building in those last few hours on April 30th, 1975. Uh, you can see a Marine guard standing on the, uh, on the fence there, or on the, on the edge of the wall, uh, and you can actually see uh, desperate Vietnamese civilians uh, trying to climb over the wall itself, uh, going around the sides of the barbed wire. Many of them were actually being physically pushed back as this scene of uh, panic and, and tremendous fear and anxiety began to build and grow. Uh, the image on the, the lower part of the slide is, is some of the, the huge amount of equipment, clothing, uh, boots, uniforms, which were dropped by South Vietnamese soldiers uh, as they retreated in the face of the North Vietnamese army driving into Saigon. Uh, they certainly didn't want to be captured or identified immediately as South Vietnamese soldiers as the communists took hold. And so as they retreated, they were dropping and abandoning uh, much of their own, their own equipment on the way. Um, you also see images from this period of um, uh, Vietnamese pilots uh, desperately trying to get out of the airport, uh, Tonsonet Airport in Saigon, landing helicopters on American aircraft carriers, ditching them at sea, trying to, to get out of the country itself. Um, the last battles themselves took place on the bridges into Saigon, and uh, the photo at the top shows a handful of uh, South Vietnamese soldiers trying to defend the city, uh, futilely uh, trying to defend the city, ultimately losing that battle. And then finally, the climax and, and the, the end of the fighting itself 
as a North Vietnamese tank uh, drives through the center of the city, crashes through the gates into the presidential palace in Saigon, uh, where the North Vietnamese military commander was then greeted by uh, a South Vietnamese diplomat who officially surrendered. Uh, and at that point, uh, the military conflict of the war finally concluded uh, by 11.30 that morning on April 30th. It was a war that by its end, uh, produced a number of staggering statistics, and, and I'll mention just a few of these. Uh, by the end of the war, uh, more than three times the tonnage of high explosives were dropped on Vietnam, an area the size of the state of California, I'm sorry, a little bit smaller than the size of the Cal California, probably closer to Florida. Um, uh, more than three times the tonnage of, of bombs dropped on that territory that were used in all theaters in all of the Second World War. Just to give you an idea of the magnitude of, of destruction unleashed uh, in the course of the war itself. That would, would be equivalent to the force of about 700 Hiroshima-sized explosions. Um, in the course of the war, 400,000 tons of napalm, uh, jelly gasoline, uh, were dropped across the country. Uh, for the population of South Vietnam, uh, if you totaled up the amount of explosive used, it would be over a thousand pounds of TNT for every man, woman, and child in the country. Um, the United States spent $150 billion on the effort, uh, an extremely expensive uh, proposition. The United States sacrificed more than 58,000 American lives uh, fighting in Vietnam. Uh, the war produced over two million Vietnamese deaths. Um, over two million Vietnamese deaths between 1960 and 1975. Uh, that statistic is, is pretty staggering. It's especially staggering when you think about the population of the country of Vietnam in 1973 was only about 45 million. So two million people died between 1960 and 1975, at least two million. Uh, in a country with a population in 1973 of only about 45 million. So what that means is about 4 to 5 percent of the Vietnamese population died uh, during the course of the war. Um, but to understand this outcome and to understand the war's broader legacies, we, we have to open up and look at a number of questions which we oftentimes don't pay attention to. And to answer these questions, we can't limit our focus to that period between 1965 in 1975. We actually have to back out to a wider frame of reference to start looking at this complex history. What were the Vietnamese revolutionaries fighting for? That's, that's a really important question. And to understand that question, we have to back up historically and expand our range of perspective. What role did countries like France, Japan, China, and the Soviet Union play in shaping the nature of the war itself, its origins and its outcomes. How was it that this Southeast Asian country, thousands of miles across the Pacific, became such an obsession and concern for the United States, the point around which virtually all of the rest of US foreign policy began to revolve? How was that possible that an area of what objectively might seem to have comparatively little strategic significance might become the point around which the United States would dedicate so many resources over such a long period of time. And then finally, what historical legacy does the war leave and what difference does it make? My goal here over the next four meetings is, be is to begin to analyze those deeper questions. And, and as we do so, I'm, I'm very aware of the fact that this is a highly controversial subject. Uh, this is a subject around which people often have very strong feelings, they have very strong emotions, very vivid memories. This was a war which devastated the lives of many American families, which had a dramatic and powerful impact upon uh, the lives of, of many of those who we work and live and spend time with in our own communities. And to raise these questions, I would argue and want to be very clear, to raise these questions does not diminish the need to recognize and to honor the sacrifices that so many American veterans made, uh, and to note the real impact of the war on their families and their lives. Um, and I think we always have to be cognizant of that. And so as I approach these questions, as I raise critical questions about the nature of the war itself, 
the way the war was fought and the causes of the war, I, I want us to, to bear that in mind. Uh, I think we've seen a great deal of popular discussion recently about the war. Many of you have probably seen the Ken Burns documentary or seen large sections of it. I think it's remarkably strong, especially on some of the issues related to the nature of the fighting itself. Um, but I'd say that documentary also focuses most clearly and strongly on that period from the mid-60s through the end of the war. Um, and these broader questions are ones which perhaps even that series, I would argue, doesn't really give us uh, enough insight into. So to get that deeper understanding of the war and that wider framework, that longer historical perspective, um, I'm going to go ahead and structure this, this bucket course in, in four sessions, many of which are actually going to focus on the period prior to 1965, to try to give us a sense of what was the war about and how did we get to that point. So the first thing I'm going to do today is to talk about the nature of French imperialism. What difference did French empire make in Vietnam, in Indochina? How did French empire transform that society? What was it that actually began to drive Vietnam to revolution? To understand that, we actually have to understand what impact French imperialism had on that country and how it fundamentally transformed Vietnamese society. The second session, uh, we'll look at the rise of radical Vietnamese nationalism. Vietnamese nationalism wasn't new, but it took a radical turn in, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, especially as, as leaders like Ho Chi Minh began to gain power. Why did that happen? Why was a radical variant of Vietnamese nationalism, one which was committed not only to independence, but to a fundamental restructuring and transformation of Vietnam, one that began to gain the most strength and credibility among the Vietnamese politically? Third, we'll look at the context of Vietnam and the broader Cold War. Um, how is it that Vietnam becomes the center of attention for the United States politically? Again, why is it that that small country so far away becomes the point around which everything else begins to revolve? What difference does the start of the Cold War make in American thinking about Vietnam? What difference do actions on the part of the Soviets and the Chinese in particular begin to play in shaping American perceptions of the stakes in this country? And then finally, how does the United States try to fight the war? What fundamental strategy does the US put in place? What kind of approach do they choose to have? In many respects, the war was not fundamentally about the, uh, let me back up a little bit, the war was not solely about uh, the killing of the enemy uh, or a military victory. War is fundamentally a political activity. Uh, and this is one of the real challenges we always have to bear in mind. And in some respects, the fundamental political goal for the United States was to invent and to build a fundamentally new kind of South Vietnamese nation. To invent a kind of South Vietnam which would have such appeal and such legitimacy that it would undercut and destroy the ability of a radical revolution to come to power. Why did the United States think they could do that, and why did it go so badly? Uh, why did that ultimately prove to be impossible? So this is a broad outline of what we'll try to do here in these next four sessions um, as I try to go ahead and set this up. Okay? All right. So let's go ahead then and start talking about that first component. Let's take a look at what happens in terms of the French impact and, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and the nature of, of imperialism. Well, Western contact with Vietnam actually dates to the 16th century. Uh, traders, uh, Portuguese in particular, uh, had been trading in and out of the area that became Vietnam, uh, up and down the coast, uh, in and out of China, uh, as early as the 16th century. And by the 17th century, an expanded missionary presence began to build in the country. Uh, and the French were deeply involved in this. Uh, French Jesuits in particular uh, spent a great deal of time in Vietnam establishing missionary uh, settlements, uh, converting Vietnamese to Catholicism, um, and ultimately, alongside the kind of economic growth that was starting, uh, they were deeply involved in trying to convert and to bring about a, a religious transformation of the country. And the Vietnamese emperors of this time period uh, were highly ambivalent about the foreign presence. Uh, they wanted the presence of foreign physicians, mathematicians, or engineers, the kind of things that came with Western contact, uh, 
but they were very wary about the opening wedge of imperialism, and they were very wary about foreign religious influence, which might further weaken their authority. And I should point out that Vietnamese imperial uh, leaders, uh, the Vietnamese emperors of the time, were really fairly, uh, fairly weak in terms of their, their authority and structure. Much of Vietnam was still governed at the local level, at the village level, uh, by strong village councils. And I'll say a little bit more about that uh, in, in the course of today's lecture. Uh, but the emperors themselves were, were deeply troubled by and, and really ambivalent about uh, what they saw as growing foreign expansion. And those fears were well justified. Uh, French incursions grew throughout the 19th century. Finally, France seized Saigon and surrounding provinces uh, in 1861. Um, they brought superior mobile weapons and technology, and they controlled a very rich rice-producing area. Uh, and of course, um, the map actually, this is a later map, and so it re defined Saigon as Ho Chi Minh City, it's its current name. Uh, at that point, of course, though, that was, uh, was the city of Saigon. Um, the French moved into the south first, took formal control of it, and later moved into central and northern Vietnam as well. They attacked the northern city of Hanoi uh, and the imperial capital, the old imperial capital of Hue, which is in uh, the center of Vietnam there. You can see it along the coastline. Uh, and began to consolidate their control. In 1887, France declared what they called the Indo-Chinese Union. Uh, and they began the process of seeking to administer all of Vietnam, uh, Laos, and Cambodia as well. Uh, those countries became part of French Indochina as France began to establish a formal colony uh, in that part of the world. And there were a range of forces, a range of motives at work, but there were three that were especially strong. The first was this, this missionary drive. Uh, Catholic missionaries were especially determined, working like, trying to work within the Vietnamese culture, converting natives, ordaining Vietnamese priests, trying to build up a greater, a greater uh, degree of influence. When they were repressed, some of them were executed, uh, harassed, or jailed the French government found a vehicle for intervention, uh, a reason to intervene. Uh, and in fact, the fact that the French government depended upon, de depended upon uh, the support of the Catholic Church uh, led to further intervention uh, as well. So that was one reason. The second reason had to do with economics. Uh, French imperial administrators anticipated that colonies would provide new sources for raw materials for growing French <coughs> industry. They dreamed of vast markets for French products as well, that holding colonies, they believed, would ultimately benefit the further growth of France's own economic uh, um, development. It would provide outlets for French investors. That was probably less important at the outset in the 19th century. Uh, industry developed more slowly in France, much more slowly than it did in, in Great Britain, for example. But it was one of the factors, and the aspiration for the future growth of the French economy uh, was one of the things that, that was there. This belief, this hope that they would begin to extract raw materials from Indochina, uh, and I'll say more about that in a little while, uh, that Indochina would also become a market for manufactured goods as well as a source for French uh, investment. But the driving force beyond missionary conquest and beyond economics and this link between industry and power, the driving force really had a little bit more to do with prestige and grandeur. Uh, empire was becoming more central to national pride, to political power at home. Uh, and this was a period, in fact, of imperial expansion by many different European countries. Uh, France had lost to Germany at war in 1870. Uh, there were demands that France try to return to the world stage. One advocate of colonization uh, in France declared that we had to prove to Europe that we were not finished. Uh, we had to prove to Europe that we were not finished. This idea of a French civilizing mission, uh, this idea that holding empire was something that European countries did um, as a way to stake their claims uh, for domination, to stake their claims for, for importance globally. Um, and France began to build its imperial holdings uh, around the world. In Africa, uh, France pursued colonies in Algeria, in Tunisia, in Morocco, in Senegal. In the South Pacific, uh, they pursued a number of island colonies, uh, most famously Tahiti, 
but many others as well. In South America, they took the colony of Guiana. Uh, in Southeast Asia, they took Indochina. Um, and this, civil, this idea of a civilizing mission, that France itself would be a force in the world, uh, was one of the animating factors. Indochina was the largest and most populous of these French colonies. Uh, it was about a th one and a third times as large as France itself. Um, and incorporating Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, uh, there was no physical or ethnic unity in place. There was no natural political cohesion uh, for this large colony, except that which France could try to provide. And the French government established their, 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 their administrative center in Hanoi uh, and began to face a number of real challenges as they tried to administer and create a kind of imperial government for this huge expanse of territory. Some of the problems had to do with the quality of the personnel that they were sent to Southeast Asia. Colonies were generally thought of as a place for government employees, merchants, or idlers to go who couldn't make it back home. Um, one historian had the following observation. Uh, the French clerk, the French clerk who was willing to exile himself to further Asia for a salary worth less than a thousand dollars a year, was seldom, either by character or attainments, an impressive representative of the ruling race. <laughs> Um, so that was one of the issues. Uh, Indochina was not an exciting or desirable posting for a government official. Um, but even more so, they faced real challenges about how to administer these colonies. How, how are they going to try to do this? How are they going to try to come up with some sort of administrative structure? Well, they could have tried to do what the British did in India, and they could govern indirectly through existing native institutions. That was one option they could have pursued. That would have been an easier course to follow, uh, recognizing that Vietnam, in, in particular, did have its own national history and an ethnic identity that was probably older than France's own. Instead, they decided to push for direct work, for direct administration. They believed, again, and argued that France had a civilizing mission to spread, that they were going to spread their ideas and culture down to the local level uh, ultimately into the culture and society of Vietnam itself. By 1925, 5,000 French officials were attempting to manage Indochina's population. That was about the same number that Britain had governing India, and India had 10 times more people in it. So they sent about 5,000 officials over, uh, and immediately, they encountered a number of, of dramatic challenges. Um, uh, fully half of Indochina's budget for that year went to bureaucratic wages. Um, and they refused to delegate substantial authority to native or indigenous population. Um, French military officers were often in direct administrative positions, while they were highly ignorant of Vietnamese culture or values. And by 1903, the highest ranking Vietnamese official in the colonial system still earned less than the lowest ranking French one. So this was a rigidly bifurcated structure as they now attempted to govern this population and do so in a situation where they knew almost nothing about the culture and the society that they were proposing to transform. Um, when Vietnamese were used, uh, when they were put into lower administrative positions, they were typically urban Catholics people that they felt that they understood or were closer to the French ideal of civilization. And they began to create a kind of new intermediary class. But there was a huge rift between these assimilated Vietnamese in urban centers, uh, speaking French, converted to Catholicism, and the vast Vietnamese countryside that they were now supposedly going to be involved in trying to help govern. Vietnam already had, at the time of the French, French colonization, a highly developed system of schools in urban and rural areas. Uh, literacy in Chinese characters, which had been adopted for written, written to Vietnamese, literacy rates ran about 80%. This was prior to the French arrival. Uh, so this was a pretty highly, highly, uh, highly literate society, um, typically using Chinese characters, which had been adopted Vietnam, in fact, had long before been heavily influenced and at various times colonized by China. 
uh, and there was a long history, in fact, of Vietnamese resistance to Chinese empire. Uh, but they had adopted uh, the written form of, of communication using Chinese characters, and literacy in those characters ran about 80%. The French decided they would ban the Chinese characters, and they would replace them with a Romanized alphabet. So one of the things they immediately did then was they subverted a traditional route to authority within Vietnamese society, a, a, a typical route which relied upon an examination system. Um, and, and by World War II, school attendance began to rapidly decline. And this division between sort of the assimilated population of Vietnam, those collaborating with the French, and the vast majority of the countryside began to deepen. French schools were established most heavily in the South, typically among urban elites. Uh, courses in mathematics and science and geography increased, but still the most highly qualified Vietnamese were rejected for administrative work. The few Viet Vietnamese that did go through French schools, some Vietnamese did go through French schools, some of them went on to Paris to study, and then they would return to have their books or their notes and papers confiscated by police who would view them as potential subversives. Um, they rarely found jobs equal to their capacities and never in higher administration or at French wages. Uh, one Vietnamese critic of the time wrote a sarcastic poem. It went like this. What good are Chinese characters? All those PhDs are out of work. Much better to be a clerk for the French. You get milk in the morning and champagne at night. <laughs> Not quite the case, of course, but you can get the sense of resentment and frustration that began to build uh, as, as ultimately the possibility of a, a more advanced uh, uh, structure involving Vietnamese leadership was, was sharply curtailed by the French approach. The most dramatic effects, though, um, had to do with the nature of, of colonization at the local level, in the countryside where the vast majority of Vietnam's peasantry lived. By the early 20th century, the French determined to try to make the colony pay for itself. And they established official monopolies in things like alcohol and salt and opium. But the real key was in the way in which the French began to alter Vietnamese life. Um, in pre-colonial villages, uh, lands had been divided between those held by patriarchal families. Oh, hold on one second. Oh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Uh, one of the things that they did then was to try to open up the countryside for crop transport and for communication. They wanted to bring Vietnam into a world market, and they built a vast infrastructure to do that. Uh, between 1860 and 1935, the French built about 15,000 miles of roads. Um, they built about 1,500 uh, miles of railroads, dug many canals. Uh, this effectively, effectively began to link the remote interior with more populated coastal areas and city centers in Hanoi and Saigon. They began to break up some of the isolation and autonomy of village areas, allowing for more direct administration and supervision. They paid for this by revising a, a traditional system of taxation. In the pre-colonial era, representatives of the emperor uh, were typically given a portion of village output for their own use and an additional amount of a crop, typically rice, would be put into storehouses to be used uh, or to be, to be protected during lean years. Uh, good harvests, for example, portions of that would be saved for more lean years. The French decided they would try to pay for the infrastructure by increasing taxation. And they had, in fact, uh, an approach here that was, was really, in many cases, quite draconian. Taxes were placed not only on people, but also on land holdings, especially on rice lands. Uh, and tax collection rates increased at about double the increase of the rate of land under cultivation. There was no increase in productivity uh, to support that, that growth in taxes either. So taxes on families that were using communally allocated land parcels increased from about 10% of the crop value to about 50 to 70% of the crop value. So in Cochin, China, in southern Vietnam, the total tax receipts in the 1860s grew from 500,000 gold francs in the, in the 1860s to, by the 1880s, about 20 million gold francs. Uh, by 1887, the year the Indo-Chinese Union was officially created, tax receipts had grown to 35 million. 
All were made to pay the taxes, moreover, no matter their economic condition. In traditional Vietnam, a person who did not own property, and actually many people did not formally own property, as I'll say in a few minutes, but a person who didn't have access to property, a person who was not a, per, a part of a family that was allocated large parcels of land, uh, a landless person, uh, was not a prestigious individual. It was never prestigious to, to be poor uh, in, in colonial Vietnam or pre-colonial Vietnam. But that person typically was also a non-taxpayer. Uh, in, in colonial Vietnam, under the French, one who did not pay taxes was violating the law. Uh, and so earlier, while it was never prestigious to be poor, under the French it became criminal to be poor if you could not ultimately pay the taxes that you as an individual, taxed by head, would have to come up with. This led to increases in, in crime and, and, and other kinds of uh, legal actions as well. The French attempted to increase their direct control also at the level of village government. Uh, in traditional Vietnam, villages had a great deal of autonomy. Uh, typically governed by local village councils, uh, which would ultimately allocate some share of a crop to the central administrative government, but typically were left alone to allocate land among those who lived there, to make decisions about uh, the disposition of, of crops, to go ahead and manage their, their local, local affairs. But the French were just determined to try to, to change that. And a French, one French colonial official put it this way, he said, as soon as the conquest was accomplished and the country was pacified, we sought to mix in with the organization of the village, to regulate it, to determine more precisely the responsibilities, to submit the administration and the budget to strict and permanent control. So what that meant, especially in southern Vietnam, was that judicial and police powers were often taken from village notables and village councils and were given directly to French police and judges. Tax assessment, the supervision of public works, the drafting of labor parties, the recruitment of soldiers, all of these responsibilities were taken from local Vietnamese councils and transferred to the French uh, as part of this administrative drive. The election of village council members was eliminated by about 1930, and instead French directly appointed uh, local officials right down to the village level. And in many respects, those appointees, as you might imagine, did not have much in the way of legitimacy among those who they were supposedly governing. That also created some, some real challenges. And so I was, there are a few images here that, that I was able to find, uh, both of which are from uh, the colonial period. The one on the left is in northern Vietnam. Those are actually pigs being brought to market. Um, and you can see them all sort of on the, on the, on the ground. And there's a large number of Vietnamese peasants gathered around, and you've got one French colonial official who is the guy in all white with the bow tie and the top hat here. Um, and it's sort of a visual representation of you know, what, what the French sort of presence uh, started to look like. Uh, in, the, um, in the image on the, on the other side, this is actually a, a family, uh, and this is a French colonial official. You can see him seated here wearing a hat. He's in white. Uh, and he's actually married, intermarried into Vietnamese, a Vietnamese family. He's got a Vietnamese wife, children, and, and a host of servants and others uh, arrayed around his, uh, uh, around his house. Um, probably the biggest transformation, though, was the creation of a land market. And, and this was, in fact, probably the biggest and most decisive impact. In pre-colonial villages, lands were typically divided between those held by patriarchal families uh, and land held by the community in common. And village councils conferred land use rights to families. Communal, fa communal lands were redistributed periodically to male inhabitants for their use, and parts of their crop would be allocated to pay for weddings or burials, imperial taxes, <coughs> or the support of teachers, or the construction of roads, or the creation of irrigation. Pre-colonial families typically held lands through generations, um, and that was something that was important for Vietnamese conceptions of ancestor worship as well. But the key point here is that land was not a market commodity. Land was not something that was being bought and sold. It was not something which was being sold, traded uh, on the market itself. Land was held by villages, 
Village councils allocated land to particular families, depending on their size. A family might hold land from one generation to another, but that land would not be bought and sold. No one had official deed or title to that land. Uh, and the allocation itself might change. If a family grew and needed more land, that allocation might get larger if it, became, uh, it could become smaller over time. Uh, and land typically was reallocated periodically, as well as some land, again, was held in common for the benefit of the village as a whole. Crops grown on those parcels, the income from that, those crops, would be used to provide the salaries for teachers or for soldiers or to pay imperial obligations or to build roads or carry out other things that needed to be done. The French, however, decided they would create a land market. They began to survey the land and tried to identify individual landowners to create a system of land ownership. And they did this because they wanted to try to ultimately rationalize the tax system. And they began to impose French property rights, a system of French property rights. So in southern Vietnam, the French began to order villages to draw up lists of landowners. Um, well, many village councils looked at this with a great degree of confusion. Um, we don't have landowners. We, we allocate land from generation to another. But the French said, no, tell us who the landowners are. We need to define landowners because we need to figure out how to allocate taxes. And we need to figure out how to allocate administrative responsibilities. Um, ultimately, what the French began to do also by the 1890s was to take away the right of villages to distribute land to allocate land. Government administrators now began to keep their own land lists. And so the French typically awarded permanent title to the user of the land at that time, not to the village as a whole. And so as taxes rose, many individuals who did not officially hold land as the system began to shake out were unable to pay them. Many of them who had small plots of land, which were officially now under the new system allocated to them, didn't produce enough crop to cover the tax obligations, and they then were forced to sell uh, on this open, this new land market. So what began to unfold was a process of redistribution of land and dispossession of many of those who previously had access to land, at least as part of the common village allocation of it. The French also began to sell off large tracts of land they directly took control over. And they sometimes granted huge tracts to colonial officials, creating plantations, or they granted huge tracts to loyal Vietnamese who they recruited into administrative work. French governors general were able to make direct concessions of land of up to 2,500 acres, which is a pretty big piece of land. The overall result then was that a system was fundamentally transformed and landholding became far more concentrated in the hands of an elite class. Poorer peasants that previously used concession land as part of communal allocations, or those that simply lost their family land because they couldn't cover their tax bills, were now forced into paying rents to landowners or paying high interest rates to borrow money in an attempt to try and cover their taxes and finding themselves farther and farther into debt. Many of them then became tenant farmers, totally beholden to others. So the most dramatic impact, again, unfolded in South Vietnam, where the French presence was perhaps even stronger, uh, or the strongest. And by the time the French uh, departed from, from Vietnam in the 1950s, about 80% of South Vietnamese peasants were tenant farmers. About 75% of land was directly under landlord control. So a system previously, which ultimately was uh, strong at the village level, which allowed for reallocation of land on a regular basis, which ultimately had fairly low tax obligations, uh, and was designed to allow villages a great deal of autonomy, was transformed, and in the process, a nation of tenant farmers was now created. Many of those who used previously accessioned land lost it. Others who held land found themselves moving into debt and deeply in obligation to others. It was also at this point that we began to see a systematic growth of wage labor as well. Um, the dispossession of peasant holdings 
forced many Vietnamese to start working in French plantations, in mines, and in industries. And about 10% of the Vietnamese population um, began to work in wage labor. Uh, rubber was introduced into Vietnam as early as 1887, which was the year that the Indochinese Union was created. Uh, trees were imported, they were, they were experimented with uh, in Saigon, uh, and latex and rubber products were discovered to be a very profitable commodity. Uh, this was seen as a way for the colony to pay for itself. By the time of World War I, plantations had become a prominent feature, and Vietnam was soon the third largest producer in Southeast Asia uh, of rubber, behind the British colony of Malaya and the Dutch colony of Indonesia. Uh, 500 companies held about 325,000 acres across the country. Uh, virtually all of them were French-owned. Um, hundreds of thousands of peasants were then brought from northern and central Vietnam to work on contract uh, in, in the uh, rubber plantations. Promises were made by recruiters about receiving rent-free homes, schools, gardens, uh, the idyllic life that plantation workers would evolve and enjoy. Um, the arrivals quickly found a, a quite different situation. On arrival, they were given numbers uh, to replace their family and personal names. Uh, they were listed that way in account books and registers. And this was, in fact, a deliberate attempt on the part of plantation managers to erase family and regional ties that might have undermined authority. Uh, the death rates from disease and overwork were also very high. Um, at times in the first half of the 20th century, about one-third of Vietnamese uh, rubber workers uh, died in their period of service. Um, work conditions were very harsh. Laborers were subject to malaria, to dysentery, to malnutrition. Uh, at one Michelin plantation, uh, between 1917 and 1944, basically between <coughs> World War I and the end of World War II, uh, 12,000 of 45,000 workers died in service. Um, the rubber companies were connected to the Bank of Indochina, directly run by the French government, and private Paris banks. Uh, and there was no legal recourse uh, for protest on the part of this working population. Uh, the image you see here actually is from a Vietnamese uh, rubber plantation uh, rubber uh, facility. Um, so what began to unfold then was a growth of class stratification as well. Colonialism and contact with the world market dramatically affected class differences in Vietnam. The range from poor to wealthy had always been there, but now it began to expand much more dramatically. Landlords, moneylenders, and merchants received the bulk of the benefits. 49% of the imports into Vietnam in the early 20th century were absorbed by the wealthiest 10% of the population. The highest paid 10% received nearly 60% of all income in South Vietnam the area with the highest degree of French influence. And the poor began to suffer as well, even at the subsistence level. As population increased, as exports began to decline, the availability of rice for consumption began to decrease as well. By World War II, the French made Indochina the world's largest rice exporter after Burma and Thailand. But commercial success was built on exploitation. By the 1930s, 70% of Vietnam's peasants were either tenants or they were farming on tiny, uneconomic plots. And as population growth increased, the pressure for food and the degree of food insecurity also began to grow. So what unfolded then in the course of French, French imperialism was a decision deliberately on the part of the French government to pursue an approach to direct rule, to ultimately try to govern all the way down to the local level, and to put in place a series of transformations designed to make the colony profitable. And in doing so, they fundamentally altered the nature of Vietnamese life. They created a land market, they put in place a series of transformations which altered the nature of Vietnamese society such that, as I'll say in a little while, when a resistance movement began to build, when a revolutionary ideology began to grow, the possibility that one would take hold promising not only independence from the French, but also promising a redistribution of resources 
promising ultimately to change the nature of society, began to have a great deal of appeal for a population that had gone through these kinds of transformations. Um, so we're right about the time I think we're supposed to take a, a 10 minute break. Um, so why don't we go ahead and, and do that now, and we'll come back and I'll start talking a little bit about the nature of the uh, resistance which we did begin to unfold and emerge. Okay, so we'll, we'll stop then, thanks. I think I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, continue. So I hope that so far in the first part of today I've given you a sense of just how transformational uh, the French impact was and, and some of the pivotal and sweeping changes uh, that the French produced in the course of colonizing Indochina and, and Vietnam in particular. In many respects, what took place then was a phenomena that helped create a population uh, that came to share a perception that their traditional ways had been destroyed. Uh, had been destroyed and ultimately uh, had been done a great deal of, uh, uh, a great deal of damage had, had been done to them. Vietnamese nationalists uh, began to make plans and try to define ways of responding to the French presence. Uh, and it's important to realize that Vietnam has a long tradition, a deep and really very long history of resistance to foreign control. Uh, for, in fact, over long periods of time, going back uh, into the, really to the Ming Dynasty in China, uh, it's, uh, 15th, 16th century China, um, uh, Vietnam had been fighting against, periodically, Chinese incursions and Chinese control. Uh, this was a population that, over long periods of time, had been resistant to what they perceived to be foreign invasion and, and domination. Uh, and certainly the transformations that the French were putting in place produced a great deal of, of resentment and, and frustration. Members of Vietnam's scholar elite um, began to try to appeal to these long traditions of resistance to foreign invaders. Um, and they tried to come up with a number of potential ways of, of responding to, to the incursions and, and to the transformations. And I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about two early nationalist leaders and to give you a sense of the different ways, very different ways, in which they thought about and tried to respond to what they saw as the damage the French were doing. The first person I'm going to talk about is, is Phan Boy Chow, who is uh, wearing glasses here. He's on the slide on the left. Um, uh, Phan Boy Chow created a modern anti-colonialist organization. Um, and was very influential in Vietnam until he was arrested and finally exiled uh, by the French in 1925. And, and Phan Boi Chao had three major goals. He wanted to unite growing resistance to the French. He wanted to restore the Vietnamese monarchy. And he wanted to modernize Vietnam to try to survive in contact with the West. Uh, he approached an heir to the old uh, imperial dynasty in Vietnam, the Nguyen dynasty, and he established what he called a modernization society, where they would try to begin to plan for civilian and military operations in an independent Vietnam. And he had aspirations of building a network of schools to train future Vietnamese civil servants, as well as uh, acquiring weapons for what he expected would be an armed revolt against the French. Uh, and Phan Boi Chao particularly admired Japan, um, because when he looked at Japan, what he saw was an Asian country that had not collapsed at the feet of the West. To the contrary, in 1905, Japan had won a major military and naval victory over Russia. That was especially impressive to him. Uh, Phan actually traveled to Japan. Uh, he spent time studying there, arranging for other students to go there and observe and to see what he believed was a kind of modernizing, successful uh, Asian country. Uh, he began to write pamphlets calling for all Vietnamese across all classes and regions to unite and rise in resistance to France. 
Uh, and he wrote one especially long poem, which was famous for its call for all bourgeoisie, officials, landlords, scholars, soldiers, farmers of all Vietnamese brothers and sisters to unite and to fight the common enemy. Uh, he began to plan a major insurrection attempt, but was discovered and the attempt failed in 1908. Um, by that point, as he approached middle age, he began to stress the need to build a modern Vietnamese state with a constitutional monarch, with representative assemblies, with universal suffrage, with a legal system, and argued that national survival would require that Vietnamese modernize itself. And again, Japan was his, his ideal of what that might look like, of what an independent Vietnam uh, would involve. In 1925, uh, he was arrested uh, as he was seeking foreign support. He was convicted under, of sedition and was placed under house arrest in the city of Hue, uh, where he lived until he died in 1940. So this was one attempt, one way of thinking about what a possible approach to this problem would be. Um, and and Phan Boi Chao was and still is to some extent identified uh, as, as one of the forerunners of, of Vietnamese nationalist resistance. Another person with a very different approach to these questions was uh, his, uh, his colleague, and they did know each other, Phan Chu Trin, uh, who is, is uh, on the other side, the other slide, uh, wearing the bow tie. Um, born in 1872 uh, and pursued a very different brand of nationalism. He hoped that ultimately France could become an instrument of reform. He thought that an insurrection was going to be futile, uh, that the French were simply too powerful, that the Vietnamese peasantry were not armed, that the idea that you could successfully lead a revolt was ultimately uh, too far-fetched but that possibly cooperation with the most progressive elements of French society could in the long term result in modernization and democratic independence. As long as France was willing to promise to transform Vietnam, ultimately leading it to a path toward independence, Phan Tru Trinh was willing to try to collaborate with the French in pursuing that goal. And he was averse to using violent tactics, believed that they ultimately would fail. He made a series of direct appeals to the French to reform their law codes, to expand the West westernized school system, to promote literacy, and called for France to live up to its promises. If you really do claim to have a civilizing mission, what you're doing right now is not civilizing. Uh, what can you do to promote education? What can you do to ultimately build a more successful Vietnamese governing class such that ultimately independence would be possible and attainable. This is what I call on you to do and, and to accomplish. Um, he was also fundamentally deeply committed to modern democracy as a goal. Uh, where Phan Boi Chao envisioned a kind of uh, constitutional monarchy, uh, Phan Chu Tren wanted a democracy. Uh, but believed that a democracy could only be attained through long-term collaboration uh, with the French. Uh, Phan Chu Trinh, however, certainly was willing to protest what he believed were French injustices, and he did so. He was arrested in 1908 uh, for participating in a tax protest against France. Uh, he was then forced into exile uh, in France, and finally allowed back into Vietnam in 1925. Uh, so for about a, nearly a 20-year period, uh, was forced into exile, and the French only allowed him to return in 1925 when he was, uh, in fact, quite ill by that point, uh, and he soon died of cancer in 1926. So these were two different ways in which very well-educated, uh, effective, effective thinkers and leaders tried to imagine what a possible alternative to French control could look like. What could we possibly do? What kind of path could we envision for the future of our country? For Phan Boi Chao, that path was ultimately one which required armed resistance. The idea, the possibility that the French were ever going to officially grant independence seemed too far-fetched. Vietnam needed to follow the path most clearly defined by countries like Japan, 
defeat the Westerners, fight directly against them, attain independence, and then ultimately modernize rapidly and strongly enough that you would be able to resist future Western incursion in the future. Fan Chutrin took a very different view. Ultimately, he rejected the idea of a monarchy, something that Fan Boi Chao wanted, uh, but he thought that armed resistance simply was too, too, too remote a possibility. We'd be wiped out, he said. We're not ready. Ultimately, the path has to be a more gradual one. What we need to do now is force the French to carry out their promises, force them to ultimately pare back some of the more oppressive policies, build the network of schools, the network of, of resources such that we'll develop a very well-educated Vietnamese leadership so that a real democracy will eventually be possible. So these were two very different views. Ultimately, both of them were very highly educated. They wrote a lot. They were very influential thinkers, intellectuals. What they did not build, however, and what they did not attain was a kind of modern sort of political structure, a kind of party which would allow them to organize on a larger scale over time. Part of the reason they didn't do that, of course, was because of the skill of French repression. Uh, both of them were, in fact, uh, arrested um, and detained by the French, and the French worked very hard through their security apparatus to prevent this kind of what they believed to be seditious and intolerable resistance from building. But other models began to emerge, too. And one of them was the Vietnamese Nationalist Party. By the early 20th century, uh, they created a more systemic organization. Uh, and, and this is a badge from the Vietnamese Nationalist Party, an early one. Uh, the initials across the top of the badge read VNQDD, which stood for Vietnam Quoc uh, Don Dong, uh, which was effectively the Vietnamese Nationalist Party, established in 1927 established immediately following the, the effective, um, well, the death of Phan Chu Trin and the, uh, the house arrest of Phan Boi Chao. So this was a different phase then. The sort of the intellectual scholar patriot phase, represented in those two predecessors, had largely run its course because of French repression, and now a more popular movement began to build. Intellectuals in this group established, uh, they began to work around a publishing firm in Hanoi, and they hoped to establish schools to educate workers, to promote literacy, to build a more thoroughgoing and wider segment of a Vietnamese independence movement. And their hope was by publishing a lot of arguments, a lot of very compelling literature, they could reach all the way down to the local level and begin a more systemic kind of what you and I might recognize as a kind of party structure with lots of members across different parts of the countryside. Um, the French wanted no part of this, as you might imagine. Uh, they censored their publications, they harassed its organizations. Uh, when the party began to try to establish local organizations in different businesses, in different industries, the French moved very quickly to try to penetrate those and, and break them. Um, and ultimately, the leaders of, of the party became more disillusioned with the prospects for peaceful change. Uh, they wanted a slow political process to build resistance. As the French began to break all of their organization efforts, they began to believe that they really had no recourse but to try to aim for violent resistance. And so they began to try to build a disciplined, more military organization with well-disciplined cells across multiple provinces in central and northern Vietnam. And their technique here was to have a coordinated hierarchy, but individual cells across many different areas, such that if one cell was penetrated, it would not then give the French the intelligence to pursue and identify all of the other cells. Each cell was connected directly to the hierarchy separately, as opposed to laterally. So this was a way to try to preserve the integrity of, and security of what they were trying to do. Uh, they began to build activities among students, they began to recruit minor government employees, they began to recruit soldiers, uh, middle class workers, they began to enlist women in their activities. Um, and they did not have a large number of peasant members, uh, they didn't have a lot of members among wor uh, working and wage laborers, uh, but they were starting to try to pursue these goals, and by 1929 they had about 1,500 members, spread across about 120 different cells. Uh, 
So by the start of the Great Depression, by 1929, about 100, about 100, I'm sorry, about 15, 1,500 members in 120 different cells. And the goal of the party by that point, by the 1930s, was explicit. And one of their documents put it this way. The aim and general line of the party is to make a national revolution, to use military force to overthrow the feudal colonial system, to set up a democratic republic of Vietnam. At the same time, we will help all oppressed nationalities in the work of struggling to achieve independence, in particular such neighboring countries as Laos and Cambodia. So what you hear there is, is a, a recognition and a, and a commitment that ultimately they're going to have to move toward an armed struggle using military force to overthrow what they call the feudal colonial system and a definition of a goal to create a democratic republic. Uh, a recognition as well that their own struggle in Vietnam might then be parallel to ones which would unfold in Cambodia and Laos, the other parts of the Indo-Chinese Union as well. In 1930, uh, the VNQDD, the Vietnamese Nationalist Party, attempted to lead an uprising among Vietnamese troops who were enlisted in or conscripted into the French army. Uh, large numbers of Vietnamese had now been conscripted into the French army and were garrisoned in northern Vietnam. They began using agents to try to infiltrate garrison towns, uh, carrying weapons that were hidden in baggage. Uh, they began to try to arm and ultimately lead a revolt among the Vietnamese troops. At the crucial moment, however, uh, a number of these troops hesitated, uncertain whether they should try to mutiny, whether they should follow the rebels. The French got wind of what was happening, and they successfully defeated the revolt. Uh, they put the top leaders of the party in prison, they executed others, and survivors began to flee to southern China, uh, escaping out of the country. So, ultimately, this early attempt also was foreclosed. So, in many respects, we approached a kind of turning point. Uh, Vietnamese society had been fundamentally transformed. French imperialism had transformed Vietnam in political terms, in socioeconomic terms, right down to the village level. In a very sweeping way, older forms of life and authority had been destroyed by the presence of the French Empire. Exploitation also sowed seeds for nationalist resistance. That resistance initially took the form of intellectuals who began to imagine what an independent Vietnam would look like, taking different paths and making different proposals for what that vision might involve. Ultimately, a, what you and I might recognize as the beginnings of a modern nationalist party, with a party structure and organization, also began to appeal and, and to, to take place. But those early cases failed. They suffered from organizational problems, they suffered for a lack, from a lack of support, and the French were successfully using their security apparatus able to put them down. But soon, however, a more durable revolutionary structure would be created. Uh, a structure which would have a great deal of appeal not only for intellectuals, not only for those who were members of, of the elite, not only for those who were the most highly educated, but would have appeal down to the village level. Uh, and this would be an approach, ultimately, which would promise redistribution of land, which would promise fundamental changes in terms of local authority, which would, in fact, represent an aspiration for a nationalist revolt, an aspiration that would end imperialism, that would achieve Vietnamese independence, but would do so in a way that would also address a number of what many Vietnamese came to believe had become insufferable uh, changes and, and structures of oppression, that the capitalist imposition uh, had, had created. Ultimately, that approach would require as well a more systematic analysis of the sources of oppression. Vietnam would have to be placed in world historical reference. And one of the most compelling arguments that would be made by this new wave of resistance would be one that would say that what was happening in Vietnam, in fact, was, was not anomalous. What was happening in Vietnam was part of a series of world historical transformations that were happening all around the world. And the ability to put Vietnam in that framework, ultimately, was one of the great accomplishments 
of a new, a new approach which would begin to, to take place. That approach would be defined uh, by Vietnam's most famous political figure, uh, Ho Chi Minh. Um, it would also unfold in the midst of sweeping international changes generated by World War II, by the collapse of European empire, and by the beginnings of the Cold War. So the next time that we meet, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about what that new approach to revolution begins to look like, what that new approach to do to, uh, ultimately, to independence begins to look like. Uh, why were the ideas uh, that Ho Chi Minh gravitated toward ones that were animated by Marx and by Lenin? Uh, why did he find them so appealing, and how was it that the Vietnamese revolutionaries were able to build a structure were able to build a powerful approach that their predecessors could not manage to accomplish. And then why was it that by the middle of the 20th century, that approach would begin to gather such momentum, especially as European empire ended and the Cold War began? So that's, that's what we'll be looking at next week. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there for, for now. And, and I'm going to be really delighted to respond to any questions that you all may have. If there's anything that you'd like to hear more about. We've got, I think, about maybe 10 minutes or so before I think we need to go ahead and wrap things up. Um, and I'll be, I'll be delighted to do that, so thanks so much. Um, uh, George. Uh, Mike, why was it that Vietnam versus Laos or Cambodia was the focus of the French colonial system? Was it the resources were greater in Vietnam or structures? I think, you know, that's a, that's a really good question. Part of it has to do with geography. Um, so, I'm sorry, George's question was, why, why was it that, that Vietnam, in particular, was the, the focus of, of, of so much of the French imperial work? Uh, they did, in fact, seek to take control of Laos and Cambodia, but why was Vietnam the, the, the point of so much French interest and investment and, and attention? Um, and I think there are probably two reasons. Uh, Part of it has, a lot of it has to do with geography. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that Vietnam um, uh, had a navigable river system. Uh, in northern Vietnam, the Red River uh, was, was navigable, was e easier to get in and out of the country, uh, and to establish a, a center of authority in Hanoi. Um, uh, and I think in many respects, they, as they began to trade up and down the coast, access to ports, access to uh, easy entry in and out of uh, sort of commercial routes was, was a big part of that. Um, I think the other reason too was that um, as, as the earlier missionary presence began to build, uh, it had just been much more accessible uh, to traders, uh, to missionaries, to, to, early, to early ventures. And I think that was, that was a big part of it. Uh, Cambodia and Laos were under Vietnamese control officially but, but I think the degree of invent, in, in, incursion was, was not really as, as deep. Um, and I think geography had a lot to do with that. Um, now Eric? In, how did the French seize power in the first place? Was it uh, an aggressive single action, or was it drop by drop? Uh, was it violent? I think initially there were, uh, uh, so the, I'm sorry, the question, uh, the question was, well, how did the French, um, ultimately seized power in the first place. Uh, how, how did, was, it, was it sort of a, uh, a direct military assault? Was it something that unfolded over time? It was a combination. Uh, they began to, uh, through trade agreements, through other kinds of things, increasingly pressure uh, the older Vietnamese imperial, imperial leadership, the Vietnamese emperor, the Nguyen emperors. Um, and finally, they did use force. They came in and they actually militarily took control of Hanoi, took control of Saigon. Um, and, and were able to do that. Um, but it was, it, I think, a, a, steadily, a steady accretion of economic and political influence, and then finally, once they were ready, a decision that they would actually go ahead and just, just take control. Yeah, Arden? Yeah. Uh, Harriet and I have spent a small amount of time in Vietnam, and uh, one of the things we noticed was that there were a number of French, especially young French, who seemed to have considerable disdain for, for the Vietnamese. Is this, in fact, something that was part of the system, or is it something that we picked up that wasn't there? That's, that's a good question. And, and, not, and the question had to do with um, uh, Vietnamese attitudes toward, I'm sorry, French attitudes toward the Vietnamese. Um, 
uh, already commented that on his, his, his own travels in that country, he had seen French who seemed to treat Vietnamese with a great a degree of disdain. And was that something that was more recent or something that was there uh, at the outset? Um, I think there was certainly a, a great degree of um, a French sense that they were superior, that they were racially superior, that they were intellectually superior, that, that they had a civilizing mission to carry out, that the Vietnamese were uncivilized. Uh, and, and it was the French responsibility to, to bring civilization to them. Um, and I think that thinking about sort of the nature of empire not only as an economic relationship or, or a political relationship, but as a, a way of thinking culturally was very much a part of what, what I think shaped the French approach to the Vietnamese. Um, and I think the French approach to, to the colonization of Vietnam reflected a good deal of that. They didn't look upon the Vietnamese as potential agents uh, or partners in, in the process of building a colonial structure. Again, quite different than what the British did in India. The British in India ultimately pursued a strategy of indirect rule. Uh, the French decided to go for a much more direct structure, rejecting the idea that they would concede any sort of political, substantial political authority to Vietnamese uh, partners. And I think part of that had to do with their sense of disdain and um, uh, their sense that the Vietnamese were so decidedly inferior that they simply weren't up to it, that they couldn't do it. Um, I think this also reflects the extent to which, I would say, sort of building on your question, later on in, in the period, when France ultimately goes to war with Vietnam uh, in, the, in the years immediately following World War II, it's also what leads the French government to so consistently underestimate the Vietnamese revolutionaries. To think that, you know, ultimately we're gonna be able to destroy this, we're gonna destroy this revolution. Uh, and, and part of that I think is because they saw them still as inferior, unsophisticated, certainly not capable of, of handling the challenge of, of competing militarily against France. Uh, and I think, I think that was certainly part of what, you know, the French thinking as I'll say a little bit next time, the French thinking was as the guerrilla war against the Vietnamese began to build in the years following World War II, you know, if we can only get the Vietnamese to engage in a set piece battle, if we can, if we can only get them out in the open, you know, if we can only find this, a way in which we can, we can have this, we'll just, we'll just obliterate them. And so it's for this reason that the French ultimately gamble on setting up what they hope is a trap in this village in northern Vietnam called Dien Bien Phu. And in 1954, uh, the French military commanders decide, we'll go ahead in, this, in the space of this broad open valley, we'll create a large French military garrison, a command post, with exposed fields of fire on each side, and we'll dare them to come out and come after us. And when they do, we'll obliterate them. Well, the valley was surrounded by a series of very high mountains on each side. And so, you know, militarily you think, hmm, is that the best place to do this? Well, that's what the French approach was. So they built an airstrip next to this garrison. And ultimately, this garrison was so remote that the only way to really resupply it was by, by aircraft. And so you would fly planes in, drop off troops and supplies, and fly planes out. And they said, we're going to wait for the Vietnamese to come out of hiding. We're going to engage them. Now, I know there are those surrounding peaks over there, but there's no way the Vietnamese are ever going to get artillery up on these peaks. You know, it's, it's too high, it's too dangerous, too hard, can't do it. Well, the Vietnamese revolutionaries, with the help from China, ultimately brought in artillery, disassembled it, marked all the pieces, loaded it into backpacks, climbed to the top of the mountains, reassembled it, pointed it straight down, obliterated the airstrip so it couldn't be resupplied and then began to relentlessly shell this French position until finally they were ready to assault across, across this open plain. And, and ultimately destroyed, in a decisive way, uh, destroyed this French garrison. And so I think part of the, the hubris that, that was at work here is, is a big part of the story. And I think it's, it's a fundamental part of what happened here. Um, yeah. Did the British and the Dutch just say, France, you can have this part of the world? That's, that's a good question. You know, what, what about the British? So the question had to do with, well, how did the British and the Dutch respond? Did they just concede their China to the French? Uh, what, what was, was there a great, was, I, and your question I think suggests too, was there a lot of imperial rivalry uh, underway? Um, and there was, there certainly was imperial rivalry. 
but the British, of course, by this point, had already carved out their own pursuit. They were, they were busy uh, working in Britain, they were working in Malaya, they were working in Burma. Uh, to some extent, I think they were, in many cases, fully, fully committed. Uh, the Dutch, of course, had already moved into Indonesia, a much larger country uh, with larger, much larger space and terrain. So I, I'm not so sure that, and I'd have to read more about this, but my sense is that each of the imperial powers effectively carved out their own sphere of influence. Uh, and then began to exploit them separately and independently from each other. Um, uh, ultimately, rivalry over colonies uh, would, would have play a significant result in later politics. Um, and all of them, of course, would, would face major challenges by the mid-20th century. And the collapse of European empire uh, is one of the major transformations that, that made the stakes of the Cold War so high. Um, um, yes? I was in the Navy at, during that time, and we were in uh, Indochina, a place called Terrain. In August of 1954, they were hauling refugees from the north to the south. I only went ashore once. There just was terrible poverty, absolute terrible poverty. Yeah. So the comment had to do with uh, the extent to which in, in the 50s, describing a visit in, or some time spent in the Navy in, in Vietnam, um, uh, the, the nature of poverty which, which was present in the country. Um, and I think that's very true. One of the real crises, one of the, great, one of the real tragedies, of course, was that because the French created a system which was so heavily bent on high taxation and export agriculture, and confiscation of large amounts of rice, the structures that would have provided for, um, in many cases, a greater degree of food security, in particular in Vietnam, were very weak. When the Japanese colonized Vietnam during World War II, the Japanese army extracted larger amounts of rice as well to try to feed its own army. Uh, they confiscated Vietnamese food reserves. And then because of that food confiscation and because of a series of really traumatic floods, there was an enormous famine in the 1940s. And I'll say more about that next time. Millions of Vietnamese died uh, as a result of the famine. And Vietnam remained a very, very poor country uh, precisely because of the way in which these imperial structures were, were effectively transformed in society. Um, also a country with these enormous gaps in wealth between large landowners who receive land, many of them through concessions made by the French, others by the South Vietnamese government, and a nation that was increasingly uh, not holding land, uh, working as tenant farmers, basically in conditions of subsistence. <clears throat> yes? We're going to, next week, we're going to get into the development of a bourgeoisie and put it in Marx's. Yeah, so the question had to do with, well, next week we'll be look at the creation of a, a Vietnamese bourgeoisie and uh, Vietnamese in sort of in Marxist terms. Um, and we will spend a little bit of time talking about that. And it becomes very important as you start thinking about the partners the United States tried to find in terms of trying to defeat the revolution. Who did the United States try to reach out to or identify among the Vietnamese population who they thought could be successful partners in stopping the revolution from happening? Um, and I think that's a really important, important question. Um, yeah? What was the fate of the uh, imperial family? What did the French do with them? Oh, that's a fascinating question. Um, so one of the, one of the, so the question had to do with the fate of the imperial family. What, what did the French do with them? Uh, they remained as figureheads. Uh, they remained as figureheads, still were involved in ritual processions, still involved in ceremonial events but without any political power and largely under, under French supervision, direct French supervision. But interestingly enough, as we'll say, uh, pretty, we'll, show, we'll see pretty soon, one of the heirs to the imperial line uh, actually was a guy named Bao Dai. Uh, the French began to hope that he might be able to now become a figurehead under which they could create an alternative to the revolution. Uh, so the French tried to find, uh, basically tried to find an alternative to the revolution by actually reinstating 
uh, monarchical authority uh, with a number of very carefully defined structures for French supervision. The revolutionaries were not having any of that. <laughs> Uh, but, but it's actually a fascinating part of the story. Uh, there, was a, there was a moment in the 1950s in particular uh, where the French thought, mm, okay, is there another way? We're not making it militarily. Is there another way we can maintain a degree of authority and control while giving at least some nominal uh, self-government to the Vietnamese? Maybe we can go back to the, the old imperial line and reinstate a monarch uh, that would at least have some degree of figurehead role. Um, it didn't work, uh, as, well, as, as we know, uh, but I'll talk a little bit about why and, and what they tried to do. Um, okay, I think we should wrap things up. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. I hope to see you next week. We want to thank Mike so much for this wonderful beginning, and we're looking forward to next week's portion as well. As you leave, remember to turn on your cell phones and turn off your T-coils, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.